Good evening, everybody. My name is Gail Davidson, um, and I was one of the curators of the House Proud exhibition, uh, 19th Century Watercolor Interiors from the Thaw Collection. Uh, my colleague, Flora Mae McCarran Cates, um, who collaborated with me on the exhibition, unfortunately uh, was not able to be here tonight. She has the flu um, and has had temperature for six days and the doctor absolutely um, uh, said that she could not come um, but she will miss the program greatly because I know uh, she was looking forward to it um, before we start, um, I want to thank Erin McCluskey uh, and the Education Department uh, for helping um, so expertly and intelligently uh, in preparing um, the program tonight. Um, and I want to especially thank Jackie Killian, the curatorial um, assistant in our department, uh, for her help with the program. Um, I'm going to do a short introduction and then I'm going to introduce the speakers, um, all of them, just so that you know the agenda. Um, afterwards, there'll be a question session um, and I will be asking some questions and we will open up the floor for your questions. But since the questions are going to be coming late, after all the presentations, um, I urge you to write your questions down so that you remember them um, when the question and answer period starts. Um, I also wanted to say, in case I forget, that the exhibition is going to be open until 8.45. Um, so those of you who want, who have not seen the exhibition or want a, another view um, will have an opportunity to go upstairs and look at the drawings again. Um, when Flor May and I were thinking of the programming for House Proud, um, we um, thought of several different um, uh, concepts um, because the drawings, the 19th century drawings in House Proud can be appreciated in many ways, um, certainly as historical documents. And for those of you who are uh, design historians, um, or students uh, of design history, um, uh, it is natural for you to uh, enjoy the drawings as uh, documents of objects in their context, in their settings, um, or in terms of the history of interior design. Um, but. Um, in addition to this approach uh, to the drawings, um, we felt strongly that we wanted to have a program that would consider the drawings um, in today's context, to make the drawings come alive and have meaning for a contemporary audience. Um, and that's why we were specially pleased uh, that we were able, uh, with Aaron McCluskey's help, uh, to work out the program tonight and to invite um, uh, three illustrious design firms, um, um, all of whom are extremely intelligent and well-spoken and um, will uh, make wonderful presentations tonight about how uh, the 19th century, these 19th century interiors um, speak to them um, in terms of their contemporary practice, um, how these drawings or drawings like them or historic uh, photographs of historical interiors um, might might impact on their uh, on their temporary uh, design uh, commissions. Um, so we're going to hear tonight uh, from Hermes uh, Maya. 
um, and Carrie Maloney uh, of the M Group uh, first, uh, and then we will hear from Mitchell Owen. And finally, we will hear from Thomas Jane. Um, and then, as I already said, there's going to be a question and answer period. Um, and we hope that uh, you will all participate, or many of you will participate in the questions. Um, so let me give some brief introductions. Um, Architect Hermes Maella uh, and interior decorator Carrie Maloney together make up the M Group. Um, they have been creating beautiful and comfortable homes uh, internationally for two decades. Uh, this collaborative team is well known for strong architectural details, complex layering of classical effects, um, good manners, and wit. Experience and success have allowed the pair to cultivate an original style based on classic forms, but more confident in its bolder, handsomer lines. The award-winning firm's work has been published extensively. Um, M Group is included in Architectural Digest magazines AD 100, House Beautiful magazines 100 Best Decorators, and House and Garden magazines Best of American Interior Design lists. Mr. Maella received his undergraduate degree from the University of Miami School of Architecture and completed Columbia University's graduate program in historic preservation. Mr. Maloney is a graduate of Trinity University and received an MBA from the American Graduate School of International Business. He was with the international auction house Christie's and has written for House Beautiful and El Decor magazines on travel and design subjects. Mitchell Owen is a partner in the firm Consolidated Design Studios and has been teaching design and history at Parsons since 2000. His firm specializes in high-end residential and retail design, most noted for their work in uh, Barney's New York store on Madison Avenue and has been named one of the top 50 retail firms in the country by DDI Magazine. He has lectured on and written about the intersection of politics and design in world, the World War II time, um, California modern architecture, and continues to um, his research in the crossing of political issues with architectural design and urban history. Mr. Owen holds, holds a Bachelor of Science from Georgia Institute of Technology, a Master's of Architecture, and a Master's of Architectural History from Princeton University. So we look forward to his um, uh, talk to us tonight, uh, as well as um, uh, the M Group. And finally, I want to introduce Thomas Jane. A recent quote in El Decor described Thomas Jane as renowned for his great style, sly wit, and we're all supposed to laugh at his, his jokes, <laughs> he told me, um, and deep grounding in the history of interior design and architecture. That summarizes much of what his work is about, using the past as a source of inspiration, but reinvigorating it with a fresh modern touch and subtle charm. Add to that his deft eye for color and tailored details, and the results are inviting, comfortable rooms that draw and engage the user. Mr. Jane holds a master's degree in American architecture and decorative arts from the Winter Tour Museum program and has had fellowships at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the J. Paul Getty Museum, and at Cooper Hewitt, um, I'm happy to say, uh, where he worked in the decorative arts 
uh, department um, and was telling me lots of uh, tales about his adventures there. Um, and he also worked as an appraiser at Christie's Auction House. He honed his craft at Parrish Hadley and Associates um, and Kevin McNamara Incorporated before starting his own firm in 1990. His decorating work and writings are regularly published, including essays on historical themes and practical advice. His latest project is a book on the finest rooms in America, which will be published in 2010. So now I'm going to turn the mic over to Hermes Maya and Carrie Maloney. We're going to share this because we sort of stagger off each other, but uh, Hermes will start. First of all, I want to uh, thank um, the Cooper Hewitt for the opportunity to be here tonight, um, and really it was great for us to uh, have a chance to study these wonderful watercolors and to think about them as inspirations for contemporary residential interiors. Our firm's architecture and interior design are rooted in the very tradition that these pictures represent, so we've enjoyed um, getting a better sense of this evolution of the modern home. Uh, we especially respond to the way that the thaw pictures capture the atmosphere of a room and uh, also the personal pride that the occupant or the owner took in their homes. Um, in this exhibition you'll see tonight, uh, we see an intimacy that is rare to find in today's shelter magazines. Now, I'll begin uh, talking to you about myself as an architect. And uh, as an architect, I respond to the thaw images that feature unity of detail, of scale, and of proportion, of style as, as well. Um, interiors where all the elements are reinforcing each other. Uh, one of my favorite of the thaw views, uh, with that in mind, is this uh, remarkable uh, Empire Salon, which is not only a beautifully executed painting, uh, which very um, adroitly uh, conveys the play of daylight on glass, on polished wood, on uh, gilding, uh, but it also represents a very sophisticated space. Everything in this room, to me, is in the same voc vocabulary. Design themes that um, all come from the uh, archaeological excavations of Greek and Roman sites, as well as uh, the recent uh, military campaigns of Napoleon in Egypt. I love the cornice um, and the overdoor that you see, as well as the trumo the, in relief uh, over the mirror. Um, I love how the ceiling, oh, sorry, I'll get the hang of this. Um, how the ceiling medallion uh, relates to the uh, design of the uh, chandelier that you see below. Um, great wall treatment where you can see the, uh, it's going from uh, marble baseboard through paneled wainscot, a series of um, decorated borders, uh, wonderful buff paint, and then again finished off by that wonderful cornice. Um, and I think in the catalog you can see there's a great description, I don't know that you can see it in detail, of the uh, tea things, but they're uh, to totally in sync with, the, with everything else in the room. Everything is working together, everything is in the same vocabulary, uh, whether it's the lighting, the furniture, the great textiles, um, the curtains, the sculpture, including the uh, copies of the classical. Um, it is a beautifully designed room, and I feel that with some very slight, very slight updating, uh, I could see this room as a contemporary space. Now, speaking of a contemporary space, um, the proportions and profiles of the woodwork in this uh, New York City library that we did are very much to me in the tradition of that Empire Salon. Um, this is a bird's eye uh, maple. Um, room. Uh, the detailing is very much inspired by French and actually Swedish uh, neoclassical interiors. And in speaking of inspiration, we have to talk about the uh, libraries, reference libraries that all of us uh, rely on. And this room to me is very indebted to um, a book called Neoclassicism in the North that was published, um, I'd say about 15 or so years ago. It was the first time that I saw a lot of these Scandinavian interiors and um, it was, it, it made a 
big impact. Um, functionally, it's a double height library, and it's in the spirit of the informal salons that you uh, see evolving in the Thaw interiors. Um, one of the interesting things of the way that the exhibition has been organized is it, it talks to you about the evolution from the formal to the, to the less formal, more private salons. Um, it's just off the fourth floor master bedroom of a townhouse that we gutted. It's a self-contained space in that there's a bar, a television, there's a, a second floor gallery, uh, and a, a garden, rooftop garden just uh, out just beyond. It's interesting how it's used because uh, because it's on the fourth floor. Um, it well, first of all, it's used by the family all the time. But it's um, on a night when they're maybe having a dinner party. You begin with cocktails in the parlor, go to the dining room, and then almost as a surprise, you go to this fourth floor and uh, have an after dinner drink here. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll just finish by saying that many of the thought. Um, uh, views mix pieces from different periods. Um, it was a deliberate aesthetic at the time, felt to be much more interesting. And it's an aesthetic that Carrie and I share. And so you can see here, uh, we have a uh, Napoleon III mantle, uh, barely see a 17th century Dutch tiled um, map over the fireplace, uh, Chinese antiques, a little bit of a Louis Kahn's fauteuil that you see, and then uh, contemporary uh, seating, Art Deco club chairs. It's, it's all about the mix. Everything in, in our projects and probably in all the work that you'll see tonight is brand new. Unlike um, the Thaw rooms that in many cases evolved over time. But I think that maybe um, with the eclecticism and the decoration, it could be a way that we're suggesting the quality of uh, evolving over time. First, obviously, we had not seen any of these rooms, or any of the Thaw rooms, rather, when we did our, they're not specific inspirations to our work because we hadn't seen the pictures. But the first book we bought um, when we opened our firm 25 years ago was probably the Mario Praz book. And we've used images like the Thaw images forever. Uh, you're, you're looking at corners, uh, sorry. My hair is I'll get better. Um, you're looking at valances. You look at very specific things. And the wonderful thing about upstairs, they even give you a little magnifying glass so you can pick up on all this. Uh, this is an 1840s English uh, sitting room today, a living room. And uh, has everything that a living room would have, a piano. It has places to read, places to, to, um, to sew. There's a stuffed leopard, very, very enamored of the stuff. I assume it's stuffed. Um, a, bir a bird in a cage. I mean, this is truly where, obviously, this family lives. This is uh, the living room of an apartment we did. Uh, it's in a, a lovely, venerable old Art Deco building. The lobby of the building was done by Dorothy Draper, and it's pure black and white marble, uh, classical urns with light shooting up, and a fountain with a Greek, naked Greek lady. Um, this apartment. Uh, the clients are in their 30s, and one of the husband's directives early on was put a television in the living room. The apartment's not big enough for, you know, sort of a proper or rather an exclusive sitting room. We want to use it. Um, every space in the 21st century needs to be user friendly, and frankly, nowadays, that's technology, and that often is a television. Um, to us, this room really reflects our work because it reflects the client's interests and their lives. The art uh, spans millennia. There are cycladic heads, uh, Han figures, an incredible Roman horse, um, pre Columbian. Um, a few months ago, Hermes came back from the opening of the Met um, Roman rooms and said he was looking at one statue and thought it would look familiar, and he turned, and then there was the famous woman who's on the other side of this that they had loaned, who you couldn't forget the mug on this woman. Um, it, it, it's an incredible collection of things to work with, and the great civilizations of the worlds are represented, and they seem to be sort of cohabitating happily. Um, these things were mostly culled from uh, the family's collection. The father created this collection, and he was a great connoisseur. And nothing makes for a great project uh, like art and objects that we can, A, it's the easiest way to shop. There's no money involved. You can just like, we'll take that, we're done fit, we return it. Um, a lot of things came from their warehouse and from their house in the country. Um, when you look at the room that we just looked at, I can go the right direction, sorry. In terms of the way it's used and in terms of the whole function, this is just a room like it with electricity. I mean, it's very basic that we've, it's a nanosecond historically between 1840 and, and today. So um, it's 
the evolution of it is is very much we think the all images are, are very contemporary in that way. Um, as to the decoration of the room, the uh, Screens here, they're a pair flanking the fireplace are by Jean-Michel Franck. Um, this screen is a great 19th century one. I can't remember the name of the motif, but I love the shades. There's a, a motif that incorporates these sort of bamboo shades. Um, the television is on a, a 19th century artist's easel. It's a gimmick we've used a lot, but uh, with a television, it's either completely hidden or you just pull it out and show it. Uh, there's sort of not much in between. Uh, the walls have a very subtle striation. You can only sort of see that they've been touched about 36 inches away, but we find that it gives the room depth. And the rug is a huge sultanabad. The room is, this is basically half the room. The other half has the piano that was missing from the 19th century image. Um, the Sultanabad is um, beautiful browns and beiges with an incredible blue highlight. We eliminate colors like that accent color. Instead of using blue sofas on this, we eliminate it and frankly your eye goes to it more and it plays up that color better. If we landed with a, a blue green sofa, it would diminish the impact of that rug. This is a 19th century lady's dressing room, sitting room, um, with her <coughs> desk, a seating area for intimate friends. It's not where she would entertain. And, and a room like this could have been in a palace. I mean, it looks sort of modest here. It's lovely, but it looks you know small. Um, this would be where a lady would retreat. So it has nothing to do with you know the, the size of the room is is not indicative of the size of where it, where it is. Um, fitted rug. Beautiful upholstery, it's very ladylike. This is the dressing room and bathroom of the apartment we just saw, the living room. Um, and it's a little bit edgier, but it's still very feminine. And it sort of is the equivalent of that curtained alcove. The lady of this house has a desk. Uh, all these doors and panels close so that the clothing part can open up, the desk can be closed off. She could have friends up here just to sort of sit around and have a glass of tea. The paneling is Jean-Michel Franck inspired, uh, and as with so much of the design work of, of, of our lifetime. And uh, these three walls sort of seamlessly get covered up. The fourth wall is a large window for the storage and the workspaces. The glass ceiling is rice paper laminated between glass, which really softens it. And uh, we designed it originally because of a series of beams that we hated. By the time we finished and installed the ceiling, the ceiling was so great, we, we grew to love the beams. Um, the rug is a, a giordis, and what we liked about it was it's so archaic looking and so, so very antique that with the snappy sort of uh, paneled walls, these, these clients were sort of wood nuts. Um, they owned all this wood. We had it in warehouses, and we sort of go and pull from their wood collections. Um, the bathroom is, is on oops, sorry, sorry. is on suite. Um, we designed the um, uh, cupboard, which is parchment and sycamore, and their great Tommy Parsinger sconces up here is the the support for the prisms that hang down in front of the independently suspended above the, the sconces. Um, the dressing room, to our minds, is a functional and pretty, and it's not too new and it's not too old. The um, tables, or by the table rather, is by uh, just as a note, Osvaldo Borsani. Um, we bought that in Paris, and then we found the chairs that matched two years later in London. So it was uh, it was obviously meant to be. So, <clears throat> so tonight's. <clears throat> discussion concerns um, inspiration in residential interior design, and for that reason, I included this guest house um, that we built at a client's weekend home in Westchester County um, because the living room was inspired by the client's visits to an Adirondack lodge that they loved. Um, luckily, you wouldn't know it from looking at this image because you don't see boulder or, um, fireplace or log walls, but it was more about um, sort of picking up on the scale of, of the place and the Adirondacks that, that had a personal association for them. And staying with that idea of inspiration, I want to point out that we've all observed that the impact that uh, international travel has on people nowadays. For years, uh, our clients would come back from London and uh, request a bathroom like the one that they had just used at Claridge's, and now they're more likely to want you know, the natural materials or, or things like that that they've seen at, uh, at an Amman resort. 
I think that the uh, boutique hotels actually um, offer a great opportunity for consumers to try on a design lifestyle, as it were, see how that fits. And, and in that, I think that they're a great um, sort of supplement to, uh, to the shelter magazines. This uh, guest house is interesting in that it serves as a getaway even for the owners of the main house. So uh, on a, it's a cozy place to spend a, a winter's weekend away from the actual weekend home th that they have uh, just sort of a half a mile away. I think it's important to uh, point out that in our work, Carrie and I share um, a feeling or a value for a sense of appropriateness in the decoration and the architecture. Um, the quality, let's say, of the woodwork, of the furniture, of the artwork in this uh, space all makes sense for the type of space for which it was designed. It's an outdoor, it's a place for outdoor activities. It's next to the tennis courts. Uh, it has sporadic occupancy. So nothing is hugely expensive. It's a mix of things. You see a uh, sort of a tribal piece, a folk art piece, uh, Chinese uh, antique cabinets, Chinese table, some French chairs, probably uh, 19th century copies. But um, you know, it, it all makes sense for the type of space that it is. The vast majority of the rooms we see, the Thaw rooms or designers tonight, are evolutionary. The furniture and the decorations come from one place and landed, and then they moved on to another place and landed again. Um, and that's intriguing. When you look at some of these pictures, and, and I'm sure as the curators here have done, they can almost trace pieces of furniture and trace garnitures, and, and they're wonderful pieces of of decorative arts upstairs that relate to the images, some very specifically. Uh, in this case, these two shots show the same uh, friend and client's two New York apartments. On the top is the Gainsborough studio uh, overlooking, uh, it's on Central Park South, and that was her first apartment in New York, or rather her second apartment here. Um, we found for her the Anglo-Indian table, but she had the uh, Paul Frankel chairs from her house in Los Angeles. Her house in Los Angeles was decorated by Fanny Bryce. Fanny Bryce, in her after her comedic career, um, was a decorator. She wouldn't take money. She would only work for friends. The quote in her book is, uh, literally, I have her, her autobiography is, if a client wanted blue and I wanted green, they got effing blue. Uh, she gave, and, and, she, and she refused money. Somebody gave her a toaster oven as a, as a thank you once, and she didn't speak to him for a year. Um, the, pa the, pa the painting is by Gromer, and that was from the client's Paris life. Uh, her first two husbands were French. And that Gromer is now opposite this painting over here, and this is her new apartment, which is on Central Park, uh, I'm sorry, on Lower Fifth Avenue. Uh, we recycled, we moved things, uh, we shopped at her Paris house, her Palm Springs house, and her LA house, uh, and it reinvents things for her and it reinvents things for us. Um, so in this case, the new aesthetic downtown was much brighter. Uh, a great Samarkand rug. Um, the walls are a combination of high lacquer and Donald Kaufman, who's a, a gentleman we use for color. Uh, he's a great paint colorist. Uh, came up with a series of whites. It doesn't look like there's more than one, but there are, uh, to sort of open up the space. So one of the interesting uh, categories that the Thaw exhibition examines um, is the study, uh, which is often a masculine space. Um, and the show basically shows you the evolution from a library to a study. It's a place in the home where the public and the private could possibly meet. This is a study that we created for our uh, self-proclaimed uh, wood junkie client, knowing ahead of time that um, his rule model uh, card table, uh, chairs, and desk would be in the room. Um, so we designed the mahogany paneling for the room with a 1950s feeling, uh, avoiding specifically a stylistic match to the Art Deco pieces. Uh, we also designed, uh, you can see one of them here, uh, two uh, freestanding Macassar ebony cabinets that are in the spirit of Ruhlmann, uh, relying once again on that, uh, on the reference library of auction catalogs and, and reference books in order to come up with details that made sense. Um, we also, as a matter of fact, did two um, built-in bookcases. 
um, again, keeping with the idea that we wouldn't, didn't want everything to be too terribly matched. Uh, we use subtle cove lighting, and uh, you know the thaw views are, are, are just full of information on, on 19th century lighting. But there's cove lighting here, which is supplemented by a, a pair of Adne uh, leather lamps, uh, as well as uh, some Tiffany lamps. Also some uh, clip-ons on the cabinet that we um, designed in Art Deco spirit. The Ushak carpet, uh, African pieces, uh, Egyptian antiquities, make for an eclecticism that uh, to me relates to the exhibition's um, premise that uh, these rooms are really uh, portraits of the occupant. And this allows me to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite uh, Thaw views. This, this is uh, Alma Tatama, the painter's library. And the space to me feels so ahead of its time uh, in its combining of comfort, Englishness, and exotic references. Um, that, that is uh, bark cloth, and you can see that up in the uh, exhibition, uh, or, or tapa cloth. But if I were to see a, a space today that was had bark cloth wainscoting like this does, um, I would think it was very progressive and just the height of chic. So um, I also spatially respond to, to this room on the scale. I, I love the circuitous layout. It's almost like it's a series of cubbies. Um, it's a room that has just what you need and no more. It's, it's got a uh, chaise with a fur throw and a pillow next to the fireplace for a nap, perhaps, uh, a baize or felt-covered work table, a great uh, nook in the back uh, next to the leaded glass window uh, with aesthetic furniture for reading. Um, I love the lightness. You, these are It's tatami mat, Japanese tatami matting on the, on the floor. I just love the lightness and the texture of that. And um, then you see the paintings incorporated into the frieze. You see what I assume are tiled uh, panels, great textile on the mantle, references to uh, Asian things. There's a sort of a Japanese lantern as, as is a fan. Um, so it's, and, and surprisingly, not one image of a uh, Greek or Roman uh, Latin mate, maiden. Um, an important ex uh, category of the exhibition uh, are the period and exotic styles that were constantly popular in the 19th century, from the Japanese salon that's on the uh, cover of the catalog to the incredibly influential interiors of uh, neoclassical interiors of Carlton House. Um, these are spaces where all the details contribute to transporting the user out of their daily life and into another world. Uh, today, we would probably call that experience uh, architecture. We included these two images to show you two very different stylistic solutions to the same design problem. This is a green room for the presenters and the winners at the Emmy Awards in Los Angeles. Uh, a green room is essentially a theater set. It's assembled backstage. It, uh, it goes up for one night's use only, and it has a simple system of walls, lighting, uh, audio, video, and, and decoration. And on the right, you see our first green room, which was inspired by the idea of a Rat Pack uh, Hollywood bungalow. So it combines uh, mid-century American pieces with uh, comfortable uh, contemporary seating, um, bold uh, louvered walls. You can barely see some plants and um, caned and, and rattan furniture. Everyone who saw the room commented on how peaceful the room felt, which is just the feeling that we wanted to convey. On the left, you see the following year's design solution, which uh, when we pitched it to the management, we described it as uh, Carlotta and Maximilian meet Bel Air. And it Nobody was- Nobody knew what we were talking Yeah, it about. was and much- And you say, no, you know, like Mexican Victorian. Well, that does scare the hell out of us. <laughs> <laughs> so to their consternation. But um, the fact was that Carrie and I had just visited the uh, Napoleon III rooms, which had been reopened at the Louvre, and we were inspired by the variety of seating that pieces that were meant to be picked up and, and just moved around the room as conversations were struck up. And we thought that this approach would make perfect sense for the celebrities that are in ball gowns and really didn't want to do anything more than just perch for a moment. So we have uh, period Gustavian furniture and um, antique uh, Italian terracotta urns that uh, reinforce the idea that we have of, of being in a neoclassical classical pavilion or a uh, winter garden in the parlance of the uh, of the thaw exhibition this is we chose this image because it truly is the most uh, 
19th century, and, and it's our most sort of thaw-ish to us uh, that we saw. This is a real parlor, it feels like. It's in a mid-19th century house in Chelsea, across from the Episcopal Seminary. And we started with the restoration. Um, first, the beautiful plaster work, but I mean, huge chunks would fall down, and then they'd fix that run, and then another chunk would fall down. So there was like a, a lot of time soaking off the old paint and figuring this all out. But once that, the basics were done, the clients, when they did this, were very young. They were in their 20s. And um, they were short of cash, it's all relative, uh, and allowed us basically to raid the family barns in Westchester, where we found everything in this picture, whether it's the Revillon Mink car throw, which was pretty great, uh, the 60s chair, lovely Louis says the canapé. Um, now this table has been replaced by a giltwood table we found that had a label on the bottom that it was a gift from Louis Philippe to whoever the ancestor was. And literally the wings were on backwards. It was like Louis called up and said, you know, I need a table fast, you know, for the ambassador from America. Completely crazy kind of collection of things. Um, the portrait is by Reynolds. There's a Sully on the other side. And the grandfather had a great predication for um, balloons and aeronautica. Most of them are now at the Air and Space Museum, but uh, they're balloon themes throughout the whole house. We added sizal and Donald Kaufman came up with a beautiful pale pink color uh, to bring down the grandeur. We didn't need to gild this lily with you know, sort of wall textures and that. Uh, the clients sort of already have wacky taste, and, um, and this was a period room in the 20th century, and now 21st century, for, for them, so. And in closing, I'm going to show you an image from an ongoing research project that Carrie and I have been working on, and it's an investigation of um, photographs of residential interiors in late 19th century Cuba, and the source is that I'm a Cuban-American. Um, this is the gallery um, in the Havana Palace of the Count of Santovenia, and um, I was familiar, I, don't, I hope you can see it, but um, I was familiar with the way that in the United States in the 19th century, giltwood uh, mirrors were uh, covered in muslin uh, in the summer, especially, in order to protect them from fly specking. But I had never seen console tables and pieces of furniture bagged as they are here. Uh, you can imagine, obviously, that the, uh, the um, pest situation in the Caribbean is uh, remarkable. Um, it's interesting to see the taxidermy and the glass domes, which uh, reflects that uh, fashion for the natural sciences. And um, just as in the thought pictures, um, these images speak about a variety of issues, whether it's gender, comfort, status, uh, privacy, the idea of seasonal modifications, the response to the climate, uh, in this case, the influence of the United States or, or co different countries on one another. And if you look closely, you can barely see the photographer in the uh, mirror at the rear, uh, which to me is, is a way to suggest uh, our seeing ourselves as we have and, and our contemporary lives in the wonderful uh, thaw watercolors. So I'd like to uh, end by thanking you for letting us tell you about our interest uh, in this wonderful collection. Good evening. Um, uh, let me begin by also thanking the Cooper Hewitt for inviting me to be here tonight um, and for the incredible challenge for me personally that this uh, turned into. Um, I wear quite a few hats. Um, one designer, one architect, educator, historian, um, and this show actually kind of brought them all together in this assignment in particular. I am um, basically a modernist, and my historical research has been in modernism. Uh, at Parsons, I've been um, given the opportunity, and it's a great opportunity, actually, to teach the general survey course in architectural history from um, basically Rome to the present. So, um, and I find in that class that it's uh, one of the biggest challenges is to actually make that history relevant uh, for students now. Uh, and it's not so much as a know your history kind of tool, this came first, this came second, but how they can actually engage it as designers and architects 
uh, and use it in a, a very contemporary way. Uh, because a lot of these students are not going on to do interiors or to do even a certain typology that we may be looking at, but they're extrapolating from that. They may wind up doing airports, high rises, um, things that do not have these kind of historical precedents. So what I've attempted to do tonight is, well, try, I tried to stay away from presenting our work, but it's in there. Um, but I have tried to almost reenact a way of looking at these items and these, um, these artifacts uh, from the point of view of how they may be mined for a contemporary architect or interior designer um, from the very beginning, from, from an early stage. So uh, what I've attempted to do is give uh, a couple of uh, snapshots. Put some images from the Thaw collection, uh, some images from kind of the height of modernism, uh, 1920s, 30s, 40s, uh, these iconic uh, modernist ideas. Um, and then later match them with some of our work, which the relationship is there. Uh, because as I, I, as I was looking at the Thaw collection, um, I did realize that there are certain themes that are very pertinent to the way we build today. And uh, this is an attempt to bring those out. So just to begin, um, the, the, the place where I saw all these things c coming together was actually the wall surface itself. So uh, in the top two images, um, if you were to consider the wall surface uh, as almost a, a projection system, a, a screen for receiving these ideas of what that interior might be, um, you have on the left the recreation of almost a garden room, a, a representation of the exterior on the interior of this space. On the right, we have Philip Johnson's own glass house from New Canaan. Uh, where very much in the same way he is starting to outline and bracket that uh, exterior, but in a, in a two-dimensional uh, way. The, from the chair rails to the, to the implied crowns and baseboards, uh, painting them black, he captures that view. Um, kind of the opposite of that is Mises, glass house, which is below, and uh, this other image from the Thought Collection where basically the walls are holders for openings. They're not uh, meant really as receptors of anything in themselves, but as uh, allowing exits and entries into the, uh, the domestic spaces, uh, visually in Mises' case, although there is some uh, permeability as on the exterior, uh, but physically and through all these walls in the uh, Thought image. Now, these are uh, two kind of iconic examples that, while appearing very similar, are uh, diametrically opposed in terms of, of readings, in terms of how that glass surface is utilized in the, in the uh, project. Another take that I particularly like is, uh, and me personally like in terms of a, a design sensibility, is when that wall starts to break down, when that wall gets um, fatter, encrusted with things, spatial, when that surface starts to take on room of its own. Uh, in the upper left hand, you have uh, Richard Neutra's uh, level house, where the wall begins to break down completely. A wall of windows becomes a wall, which is half fireplace, uh, which sh begins to shield a, a, a seating area. Uh, the window turns from a view out to a view back, uh, to a backlight situation, uh, where that wall starts to encompass uh, part of the living situation. Um, in the Thaw collection, it, it's interesting that we brought the same image uh, forward for consideration, because it is in that image also where I see kind of the most potential for uh, not using uh, these images as uh, historical uh, sources, uh, but taking them one step further and creating a, a, a type of space, a sense of space that is related to now as much as then, uh, no matter what the style. Now, um, this is some of our work on the right. Um, upper left hand so, uh, uh, image is Le Corbusier's Aux Enfants Studio, um, one of those iconic masterpieces of modernism. What I could see coming out of this is in this image, and similar to the Thaw image in terms of the way that the container of the room is uh, attempted to make it go away. It's, a, it's, it's an attempt to break the, the corner of the box open. 
um, with views, with uh, things in reality, there's a certain time when architecture and design need to step back. Right? You can remove the form to allow that place to be. Uh, another kind of interesting example that uh, I found instances of was in Lewis's uh, Mueller house, Villa Mueller, where this wall surface expands to become the furniture, to become the, the passageway, to become the, the entire project in a way. That entire house is a combination of walls that open to become inhabited and to move through. Uh, in, in the literal sense, in the thaw image, we have that window seat, that place inside the wall that is the, the go-between, between, between the, the space of the room itself and the exterior. Uh, in our own work on the right, it's, it's, especially in this project, it was always a question of how to turn this, uh, this 3,000 square foot loft space in, in Soho into something a little more interesting than a big box. So it's about playing with that exterior wall and, and getting that wall to, to become things, kitchens and bathrooms and, and even spaces in the bathroom and create that depth uh, from, from inside. Uh, in this example, I, I paired uh, uh, the, the Charles and Ray's Eames um, design for themselves in the Pacific Palisades, uh, which in itself at this point is a um, an icon, uh, an icon, icon of a certain time, but also an icon that's often taken out of context uh, with the, the, their wall and in the images that they present of the wall uh, of this kind of glass house with some uh, color, some, some closure. It's also a place of meeting of interior, exterior, and the Ames' own collection of objects. Uh, it starts to show a little bit in here where, where that wall is a register of, of the life that goes on inside and outside of that space. Uh, that translates quite easily into our retail work uh, at Barney's. It's, it's establishing that framework for our product in this case, the life of the, the store, the people who are visiting, the people who are taking the products and, and want to be the products, but also establishing that kind of, I would say, almost neutral uh, framework for, for the things that come into it. Another example of this wall kind of opening up and, and, and becoming inhabitable is Frank Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, iconic Roby House, where the, the wall almost is incidental. It's leftover. It's whatever happens after the furniture, after the lighting, after the, the uh, decoration, after these uh, ornamental embellishments. The wall is just whatever's left. So it's a, a different way of thinking about uh, the, the plan, the, the, the form, the design, and its integration into its own uh, context. Um, in these works here, uh, this is also the same loft that I showed before in a rendering that uh, shows kind of the overall idea where it is moving from space to space to space within one larger open space using the, simply the crust of the wall to start defining those spaces. And then uh, finally, it, I, I'm, I brought in the example of Pierre Chereau, which is a completely different kind of use of, of wall. Uh, I, the idea that a wall is a machine, a, me a mechanism that can be uh, modified and changed uh, depending on the use of that space uh, as uh, time goes by and, and literally throughout the day, because these, these walls are meant to change daily uh, as patients come in to visit the, uh, the, the doctor. Um, and that's, that's um, I don't know, kind of the, the end point where the wall actually does become this, this physical player within the daily life of the structure. Uh, on the right, we have uh, a very recent project still. You, know, you can still see the dust. But um, it's uh, almost obviously still, uh, still a few things to do. But um, it's very much about opening up um, these walls as, as a participant, the, the study that's that's concealed behind the kitchen with the hidden study above with the motorized doors that open to, to reveal shelves that pivot out to, to, to allow the, the owner to, to control and to be able to use that space uh, in very different circumstances uh, throughout, not necessarily the day in this point, but uh, at the, in this case, but um, throughout the kind of life cycle of, of him in this apartment. Um, so in closing, it, the, the, the um, the Thaw collection itself is, is a wonderful, wonderful way, and I, I, I still 
that still is the goal, <laughs> uh, to figure out how to get my modern students, my contemporary students who are interested in these, these things that uh, they see as completely removed from their everyday practice, their, their, you know, their homework, their studio projects, their um, interest in, uh, um, like I said, her, uh, airports and, and high rises, to take a look at these documents, these inc incredibly interesting and critical documents to, to the evolution of, of their design place. And I would actually argue that there's a much more, relation, much more of a relationship between the Thaw collection images and these modernist icons than anyone um, would, would recognize admit and it takes some digging but it's there and it's uh, in bringing that part of the story to life that these things become even more and more relevant to uh, the design procedures of today thank you I'd also like to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak with you tonight um, about decoration, which is something I'd love to talk about, and also about looking at historical images and how they influence our work. Um, we often work on historic properties where uh, the clients want a fresh face, but they want to keep the uh, historical dimension very much in the present. Um, and I'm often saying, in, in the, I often say in my, to my office and the people that work with me, my colleagues, happily are here tonight, you know, how can we make this different? How can we spin it in a new way? How can we make it, and we hate to use the word over and over again, fresh. But freshness is really what um, uh, our lives are about today, is how, how to see things in a new, a new way, um, not to throw away everything that's old, but to bring it forward into the present. And in fact, uh, I feel like a, a tradition is something that is still active in the present. If it's not active in the present, then it's no longer a tradition. It might be a dead tradition, but for a tradition to be alive, it has to be with us today. These are two slides. One is an um, a illustration of my loft in Soho on Green Street, and the other is a room that was made in 1840 in Germany. And it's one of the picture, type of pictures that we look at a lot, and, and, and what really um, resonates for me is it's pink. And pink has been a very unpopular color for the last uh, 70 years. I think since Marshall Field um, started um, using pink for boys, um, it started being associated with girls uh, for some reason unbeknownst to us. But um, so pink is a, was a foreboding color, especially maybe 10 years ago. 10 years ago when I moved into the space, and um, we moved into a big white box and um, house beautiful asked to photograph our Thanksgiving. And in order to provide a background, I painted these huge um, cubes of color on the wall at, to offset our rather small antique furniture in this very big loft. And I only thought that they would photograph very closely and not to show that they were just random blocks of color along the wall. And I thought, oh, let's be novel and let's make one big and pink. Um, and in the end, um, uh, our friend Pilar came for dinner, and she loved the way the decoration worked, and she loved the idea of how to how to use color to shutter in a big space, um, and, and to set off things that are, in truth, too small for a big room. But I think also the reason it worked was because of the colors, the novel colors, and it, and when she wrote about it, she called it bubblegum pink, and I tried to get her to change it, but she goes, "It is bubblegum pink," and in truth, she's right. It's, I also like to look at inert things like porcelains and um, fabrics that haven't faded because the palette and, uh, before the 20th century was very bright and very fresh. And as you can see in the Shaw collection, there's lots of, of lively color um, that we don't often see in our interior today. And that's one of the ideas I like to think about. And I think the reason, isn't, is, the reason why there isn't as much color is because in the 19th century, and even in the early 20th century, color was very precious and very special. And you couldn't have much of it unless you were very rich. And outside was pretty brown and uncolored. And today, our world is very colored. And uh, you walk down a, a street, or you go to a strip mall, or you go almost anywhere. In fact, Target, who supplied this room, it's all about color. And so it's become devalued. And now beige is a welcome re relief. So I, had, I have I've been thinking about pink for the last decade. And when I started working on my own apartment in um, New Orleans, where I can do whatever I want, um, I painted the sitting room pink. 
and um, it was it was somewhat shocking to the public. Um, but what I found out about pink is it's really an amazing color because it, it's one of the most changeable colors. And we get a lot of sunlight. And, and during the, in the morning, it can be just the brightest color. And by the evening, when the sun is on the other side of the building, it has this very soft and sort of uh, dusky appearance. Uh, and I think the reason it works so well is because it has both yellow and and red in it, which is you know such a warm and fresh combination. It's a, such a warm combination, and and also people look good in it because it's a, a flesh tone. In the same apartment, um, in the same apartment, I I always wanted to. Uh, I have this room called the we call it the mural room, but it's a, a room we use like a salon, a, a dining, parties, um, sitting. And I've always wanted to have a room with scenic paper. And that's paper that has a mural that wraps around the room. And, and most sets were printed in Paris in the early 19th century. Uh, I came to be interested in scenic paper when I worked in museums. Uh, and we were asked to restore one of the, uh, a room with paper very much like this at the Fife Room. And in fact, when I, st I first started looking at interiors and renderings of interiors that were antique, it was to look for ideas and knowledge and how to restore rooms. And so in fact, it's somewhat full circle that we're worth looking at drawings tonight. And I um, show you this period room, which was restored from looking at um, the drawings that we're speaking about. Anyway, scenic paper is very costly and very fancy, and my house is very modest. And I thought putting a big French uh, wallpaper, a French scenic wallpaper in it would be pretentious and over the top. Uh, and I, the house is in Mississippi. It's in, on the Mississippi and Louisiana. So I thought that it would be great to do a scenic paper um, that spoke to the Mississippi and was a new take. Um, so you can see here the Fife Room. And then you can see our apartment with this sort of uh, modernist paper. And it was based on a, another print source, uh, an illustrated book that I was given as a child called The Mississippi. And, um, it was written for children in 1941 by a man named um, McClinton. And while we didn't copy the book explicitly, we did copy the tenor of the drawing and um, caused the Mississippi to wrap around the whole room in a, what I think is a very dynamic and magical way. So this is a key example of how you can take print sources and the idea of something that's historic and recombine it in, in a fresh way. I've thought a lot about these images at, that were mostly made for um, what I call personal use. The, the rooms were rendered um, to record them um, and to share them with friends and associates, but not necessarily to publicize them. And the, many times um, when our rooms are photographed, they're photographed for publicity. And in fact, the rooms that get published are the ones that are the most photogenic. Um, for example, the room with the big pink cube really look good in print. And this is an illustration of one of our rooms that was on the cover of House and Garden. And I think part of the reason why it was published is because it had a very graphic nature. And that graphic nature was due to um, this picture that I'd known since graduate school. It's called um, The Country Breakfast. And it was painted in 1775. And you can see this man uh, relaxing with his um, dog. But more interestingly for me, on the back, wall is a, a very beautiful green color. And it um, has a border of, of here it's, it's gold. And through more research, I learned that it was probably painted paper. And so the, when I worked with a client that collected antiques, I said, why don't we cover your dining room with painted paper and use a border? And that translated into this image. And you can see a detail of it in the top corner. And then if you look closely behind the house and garden, you can see the paper uh, and, the, and the border. A lot of ideas we take almost verbatim and um, adapt them. This is a bedroom on the Upper East Side. And you can see the curtains are made of gauze, just as they are um, in the Thayer picture. Um, and why I like using gauze is because you're able to replicate um, the volume of historic um, curtain treatments in historic rooms, but you don't have the burden of uh, heavy uh, formal fabrics. <laughs> and today, most people don't want the curtains that were um, popular in the 19th century when the Thayer drawings were made. But the rooms often demands um, uh, uh, the volume and to, to balance the architecture. 
So this was a great example where we had a st antique windows with the, um, antique style curtains, uh, but that were more contemporary um, for a young family. And this is another um, uh, verbatim quote. Uh, you can see the design for um, the pink curtains with, um, maybe I like them because they're pink, but more importantly, the shade underneath is, is uh, painted or uh, decorated with a design. And um, I've always liked decorated window shades. It, it stems from my childhood. Uh, I had a pretty um, Episcopalian childhood, but the family that I spent the most time with, were, the, their sons were my age, um, were um, these crazy expatriated Jews from, um, from Holland, and they were very, very um, bohemian. So it gave me wonderful uh, balance. And one day I came home from um, school, and Mrs. Kahn was out on the back lawn, and she'd taken every one of her window shades and rolled them out on the lawn, and she was painting them with these big uh, 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 Picasso bursts of color so that at night when she went to sleep, she, got, she had the benefit of the de decoration. Uh, well, my mother gave me a little balance, so I it was not, I'm not painting the window shades of Picasso burst, but I did think that having decorated window shades is pretty, a pretty cool idea. Um, and this room, which happens to have a 360-degree th view um, with water on all three sides, it's on a, basically a sandbar, um, I thought the window shades would become paramount in the decoration, and hence we were able to stencil them with Krisha Marathi, um, st helped us stencil them in this more classical Greek key design. And another sort of quid pro quo um, paraphrase or sampling is um, the use of case covers on these chairs. This room was um, designed intentionally for photography. It was part of a show house that we did for Town and Country Magazine. But you can see the 18th century style lolling chairs um, with case covers, very much like the um, illustration of the conversation group from also from about 1775. And here, um, uh, uh, t with an eye to novelty, uh, the volume of the room demanded some sort of chandelier or device over the table, but I didn't want to block the view with a um, chandelier, so uh, I substituted uh, uh, this mobile from the museum gift shop. Mm -hmm. And it obviously makes a very fresh and dynamic space. And I love um, e this picture now is about 12 years old, and it was a little more radical using a Saarinen table at that juncture. But I still think the beauty of the Saarinen table with the Georgian chairs is a, is a, is a nice com combination. And here's another um, uh, almost verbatim reference. But you know, we look at these pictures so much in my office that it was sort of accumulation of pictures. The top one is a, a by Sargent. It's American, about 1801. And the lower one is called the um, Antiquarian, and it's about a collector in the 19th century um, collecting 18th century things and displaying them in a rather 19th century way. But you can see they both feature these um, red curtains. And we know from research that red damask was um, the most popular fabric in 18th and 19th century America. And to see them repeat in um, images is, is interesting to us. Um, so when I was working for this collector of American furniture, we were struggling with how to um, crowd it all into a, a rather small house. And we decided to do the decoration en suite, meaning that the, the upholstery, um, as you can see on the sofa, and the curtains would be the same material. And um, we picked this antique red because of the historic reference, and also because it had a very buoyant nature that sort of uplifted the, um, uh, the Americana. Uh, happily for us, they combine it with Indian, Asian Indian sculpture. And we had this whole fiction that there was some sea captain who came back from his trip to um, India with this cargo that combined you know, beautiful Georgian furniture and wonderful Indian sculpture. And finally, I'd like to close with this picture that's had a great influence on me. It's a picture of uh, uh, Wilson, Charles Wilson Peel. Was, his, his own portrait, self-portrait from uh, uh, 1822. And he had a, he was also a painter, and he was also a, one of the first museum owners in America. He made a place called Peel's Museum in Philadelphia. And I've always loved the conceit of him pulling back his pink curtain um, and revealing his museum. And I, 
I um, have always been interested, in, or I've always had a curiosity, hence my curiosity in old prints, but also I've loved um, rooms full of curiosities. And this is a, another view of my loft that was um, um, redecorated after the pink cube um, to accommodate our collection of um, American uh, books. And you can see at the end of the room a pair of um, mirror doors, actually uh, colored mirrored plexiglass doors, which open onto our um, cabinet of curiosities. And um, at the left side of the screen, you can see um, a detail of that room. So I think the ideas that I, I, I gather from interiors is the, is the, um, the, the that you can use them as a resource to exercise your curiosity, and the curiosity can manifest, 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 the curiosity can manifest itself quite literally, or it can be uh, taken as an abstraction. And um, I'd like to close with a um, Dorothy Parker quote about. She wrote that the cure for boredom is curiosity, and there is no cure for curiosity. <laughs> Um, I hope you enjoyed these three presentations as much as I did. Um, each, each of them was fantastic uh, in its own way and uh, presented all kinds of ideas that I never even thought about um, in respect to these drawings. I was so busy studying their history and their content um, and not really responding to them as, um, as design models uh, in respect to how the spaces are used and, and enjoyed. So um, I really benefited um, very much from hearing the talks, which were so intelligent and, and well-spoken. And um, uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, so we're going to um, open up this question um, period with some questions coming from me, uh, just to get things started. Um, and then afterward, um, I hope that you will have uh, questions as well. So let's start with one, and you all don't need to respond to all of them, but um, uh, let's start with the first one. In the 19th century, documentation of domestic interiors could only be accurately accomplished by the draftsman or the draftswoman. Um, photographic methods were unable to capture one of the most important elements of the interior, color. How do you think the use of color in domestic spaces in the 19th century differs from the 20th and 21st century uses? Any of you have response? I thought Thomas's point earlier about the, the expense of paint, the expense of pigment. Uh, made it such a luxury in the 19th century and before that. I mean, it truly was uh, very rare to get a great red, a great blue. These were highly desirable. Uh, and yet today, we did an apartment at the Pierre Hotel, and it was all about being ivory. The luxury was the fact that it had no color, that it was all about the Impressionist paintings. And, and in New York City, after leaving the grittiness, you came up and you were you know, confronted with ivory. Um, so I mean, I think color. On the other hand, as we're talking about photographs and color and the trueness, we constantly get calls from people and they say, you know, could you tell me what color is on page 42? And you say, well, it's a photograph, so you're really not seeing the color, you know. <laughs> but and it was done by Donald Kaufman for clients. It really is a special thing. You can't buy it. And they will argue and argue, and they said, well, turn the page because it's the same room and it looks like a completely different color. Mm -hmm. The transposition of color is, you know, we're not seeing two, in, even in a photograph, reality. It's just easier to take a paint, you know, match a paint 
paint chip to the picture and say it's that color. And they, and they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then to have the conversation. <laughs> have your list for when they call yeah. out and lie. Just pour that pretty color that looks okay. good with it. <laughs> I, I can do that, but uh, it's not fraud. It's just being kind. <laughs> Gail, when you talk about color too, you have to talk about light. And I think that um, you know what, one of the things that. Um, the, the thaw views show, they obviously show all sorts of lighting sources, but um, I, I try to imagine the moment when gaslighting replaced candles. And you know, you, you read about those first gaslights that were the equivalent of I don't know how many candles um, in a fixture. So that had to be a moment in, in let's say, the use of color uh, historically. And then nowadays, of course, we have um, you know, just a variety of, of lights indoors. And, and that definitely, I think, impacts the maybe the more subtle in the use of color that, that we probably all favor. There's a couple other things too. Uh, when I was in college um, studying architecture, my um, professor pointed out that you can't do color and scale, meaning that you could be doing an elevation of a room and you'd want to paint it in the color you imagined it, but it wouldn't translate to the wall. And that's always really important, and I think that's important to look, when you're looking at those drawings, they're rendering the perceived color, but not necessarily the real color of the room because of the scale issues. And people don't think that color changes in scale, but of course it does. And just look at all of us who painted a room yellow the first time and picked out this bright yellow chip and painted the whole room that and realized the reverb of the yellow. You don't, you don't think about that until you do it a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> and also, the light levels were different, which made a huge difference. So, you know, you go into like Mount Vernon, and, and the, you know, the, the rooms are like these technicolor colors. But yet they were a lot of times they were made to be uh, seen in candlelight. They were they were night rooms and with low light. And interestingly, I was just reading uh, this uh, called Caldwell. Uh, I mean, uh, Dempsey and Carroll published a book about. Um, uh, lighting and, and, and when you should light your house, and they've said that even in the midday, if you're having the most formal um, levy, you should have your gas lights all going. But then they go on to say that the only, you know, even though gas light is readily available, you should only light your house with uh, your dinner table with candle because it, candles because it's far more flattering. So even in the advent of artificial lighting, the candle um, is paramount. In fact, it still is today. I think another very important point that you already mentioned was the kind of what's happening outside the house at the same time with color or the lack of color in the 19th century um, versus today with the media super saturation. It, it's there. It's there already. So it is this kind of respite against everyday life. Like you want to, to retreat from it to a certain degree. Um, and then it has its flourishes. You know, it comes back in a certain kind of unexpected way, which is great, which is about that surprise. Uh, yes, that's what um, I was going to ask you in particular, since you're, you stand out as a, the modernist in mm -hmm. the group. Um, do you think that um, as uh, modernism retreats more to the past, mm -hmm. um, there, there are still many, including myself, um, who um, like the rest of uh, a neutral interior. Um, but do you think that that will change? Do you think um, as, um, a as we move forward, do you think in terms of contemporary design, uh, there will be increasingly more use of color? I think there will. And the interesting thing about it, though, is how it's used. Because in the 19th century, there, there's a multiplicity of colors. There's, there's many colors and patterns, and, 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 the, and partly to do probably with the intricacy of the detail, so that you have many more surfaces to paint. <laughs> Um, with modernism, as, as you go forward, and you know, it's not that, but well, it's uh, kind of a side, I'll, I'll come back to that, but it, it, there's more of a use of the bold, grand statement of color. Um, so there would be one color in one place and, and held back. And I think that, you know, that kind of has been there through modernism. Um, we think of the dish deal, we think of the, um, even Corbusier's painted rooftops. The color is there, it's just n the surface, is, the surface that it receives, that receives the color has changed as well. So uh, there, there will be an influx back, but it's, it's in a different kind of uh, mode. 
also colored lighting. There's a big trend to have, mm. you know, being able to light things in a myriad colors um, from a panel, which you couldn't do easily until the last 10, 10 years. I, you see a lot of that, a lot more of that interiors. Mm -hmm. And, have, and that have are, you done that? Uh, no. In other words, instead of paint, instead of painting a wall that you project color onto it, um, and you could change it, couldn't you? If yes. you did that, yeah. Have and it's you? much more sophisticated than those round. Remember those round lenses yeah. that rotated on Christmas trees. <laughs> Well, I just found out about it the other day because I'm working with a very contemporary art, art, uh, architect. He showed me a room that's basically made all, out of foam, and it's very intricate and pierced, and it has a whole system of lighting behind it so that it can change nature very easily. And um, uh, it's an auditorium. It's not a, a domestic space. It might be a little disconcerting to do it in the privacy of your own home. But yes. <laughs> I, I could see it more in, in a commercial setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, yes. I just wanted to ask a question. Sure. Since we're in a different, you know, politically, we're in a different place now than we've been in a long time. And I noticed, with good use, since you were talking about color, that we're seeing a lot of greens and a lot of oranges and a lot of hot pinks. I mean, I just went to Jonathan Adler and my little gift and look at the back. I mean, just look at the back. So, I mean, I'm like a color person and I find, I'm just wondering, depression glass, when we were back in the 1920s, they came up with ways of being happy. And are we, the Jonathan Adler pillows, like they make you feel a little happy when you have a little color than just to have the beige in the room. Do you think that, that those, Clients are going to call you and say, "My God, I want to come home and, you know, get a little turquoise or something." <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no. Your clients are always going to be rich. <laughs> I hope they're not. Oh my God. <laughs> no, but I think that uh, years ago, when we were, you know, debating with a client about some color, and again, I hark back to our friend Donald Kaufman. There's a wonderful couple of books, but one of them is called Color and Light, and we worked with him exclusively for 25 years. He does all our paints. When in doubt, paint is cheap, you know? I mean, really, it's easy to paint that wall. If you don't like it a year later, it's, you know, so it is a wonderful way to make an easy impact, um, you know, inexpensively. But do you think it's going to shift away from, from the beige and the... I don't you know. know I've, very, what like, I've, over time, I just think it's such a personal thing. Some people are just completely into color. I agree that. the way they dress. You know what I mean? They just love it, and that's what makes them happy. Other people are just beige and gray, and yet that doesn't mean that their art isn't colorful or that their lives aren't colorful, but there's, it's, it's very much an eye and sort of a way people react, and, and it's very personal. That's the big change between the 19th century and the 20th century. There's not one dominant style, meaning that... Not everyone is living an empire life. Some people in New York are, and some people have walls that change colors. It's, and it's, you can indulge yourself. But, 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 you, but you know, even as late as the 1950s, everyone had the same decorators or the same type of decorators, and they had the same type of interiors. And now it's across the board. That's probably one of the reasons why there's not yeah. one premier tastemaker saying you have to paint all your rooms pink because we're having a depression. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a myriad of things. It's, it's very much much more every it's like I was we were at a program the other day where people uh, people can be much more expressive of their own individuality now and that means that color is used in many different ways we're freer we're freer <laughs> <laughs> not free but freer <laughs> a question uh, historically room color has been associated with certain rooms like the libraries would be painted green or you know the dining rooms would be red or the bedrooms blue and yellow do you think it's still true today or we're moving away from it and kind of more freer in terms of our use of color in room associations I mean, there's still... I think we're definitely freer, but there's certain things that just work. And a red dining room is a flattering kind of color for a, a dining room. And I, I mean, so it's that kind of... But aren't there colors that you would never use in a bedroom because they jazz you up too much or something? Say that, yeah. But, yeah, but red. I do think that there's... Uh, it's like, like any set of manners. There's certain set rules that we all know, and sometimes we break them. But it's, you know, my old boss said, never paint a room all blue, a dark blue because it's really depressing. Right. But he made a fortune painting rooms lacquer them sort of polo green and they were you know he, that's all he did and they're almost the same 
value, but he said, balloons are depressing, don't do blue. <laughs> but interesting. <laughs> Donald Kaufman said, I've had some literature, what, what about blue? He said, the reason they call it blue. You know, that's a, and it, it, is, it is a color that you... But if you make a blue with a lot of yellow in it, it's like... Exactly. Like, you know, it's mm -hmm. incredibly beautiful and yeah. surprising because no one paints a room blue, so you can get, and they're very historic, so you can get a lot of mileage out of using blue deftly. Mm -hmm. But I, I, and I paint almost any room blue, but I wouldn't paint, say, almost any room brown. You know, there's certain rooms that just... Well, interesting, we were at, at the public library, we were helping them pick out a color for a new room called, what's well, an old room, but the Solomon Room, a huge room, um, that they're changing uses. Donald Kaufman and I, we were into this peacock blue. It was going to be incredible. And had that green in it, it was just, an, but it was an intense. And the committee freaked completely. You know, it became a lovely French kind of gray. The pictures look good against it, but... There is a fear of color, you know, and uh, and that in that case, paint was not cheap. You know, it was five thousand square foot room, so it was a lot of paint. But um, yeah, so I'm, again, blue was a happy color in this case. So yeah, yeah. no There's, rules, no rules. I had a question concerning color. Um, the, in the thaw drawings, as you know, one of the um, points that we uh, tried to make in the exhibition was. Um, the relationship of color and the room itself to gender. Um, in your own work, do you, um, does this have any impact on your choice of color? Um, do you consider um, one color to be more female or another color to be more male? Um, you're laughing. Is it a dumb question? Well, we were, we were working on a child's room in, in Chicago. It's a, new, a newborn girl, and the client wants a pink room. And I, you know, and I just went and said, pink is for girls. You're enforcing gender roles on <laughs> your poor child, she goes, I am, and you're right. <laughs> and she picked like the most, the pink is just unretreating. And, and luckily the room's all white, it'll look okay, but, but we were like. That, look. that white loft I showed has a really nice pink kids' room for the girl. Yeah. Really great blue one for the boy, too. You see, it's, <laughs> that's, but that's I think it's still, yeah. you know, children, With we children. Get, them, get them early and then loosen up later. <laughs> so that's where it really, that's, there's, and people like yellow, yellow living rooms or yellow drawing rooms that are flattering, that, that, that seems to be something people ask for. We try to dissuade them because it gets, it's hard, you know, it's a hard thing to live with, but, but that's a popular almost cliche request. Um, wouldn't it have to do with the tone of yellow? Yes, and what they have and what's going in it and what light, it, what direction it is. And, um, th you know, there are many tributary, um, even your historical reference, what you grew up in and what, you know, whether you looked at the Thaw Collection before you came to the meeting, there's all these things could be piled into your decision about what color you want your room to be. Um, I was just talking uh, to our class yesterday, some of whom, some of uh, the class members are here tonight. Um, I was talking about the aesthetic interior um, and lots of um, designers, including uh, Godwin and Whistler um, in his activities as a designer, used yellow. Um, and used um, so. variations of yellow um, uh, in in rooms. I suppose perhaps to add, I don't know, glow perhaps Sunlight. or. That's very interesting because there is, I, and I'm no expert on it, um, but there is that whole movement in the 19th century, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, that had very specific therapeutic uses for color moralistic, therapeutic, they were, they were very definite solutions to certain physical ailments, so much mm -hmm. so that you could sit in front of the colored window between you you and the actual window to, to, to cure yourself. So there is that kind of um, uh, Psychological. A psychological. Color psychology and, and physiology. No. Physiology. It's more than psychology. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's affecting your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it sounds extreme, but it's, there's modicum of truth to it. <coughs> 
There is, because there's, there's the later um, psychological studies of color mm -hmm. in spaces. Right. Uh, they're very rudimentary, and it has to do with pinks and blues, about calming and, and not calming. So there, it, it's not approached from color theory. It's approached from uh, kind of behavioral science, but there mm -hmm. is some truth to it. Well, years ago, I asked, uh, again, to argue, Don Coppin should just be here, um, Don Coppin about what color was the best to work in. If you're building a factory, God forbid, uh, de decorating a factory, what color would you paint the factory? And he said, it wasn't about the color, it was about the freshness of the paint. He said, a clean, well, you know, a space that looked new generated more positive vibes than, so it wasn't, literally I've said that same thing to a color person who said it completely wrong. But I know what he meant. It's, it's not as much often about the psychology as about the color as the sort of, it's, it's yeah. It's the fact that it's the condition, new yeah. And and so that revved up their energy. Mm -hmm. Fresh paint. It's mm -hmm. always been. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's works the smell me. of the paint. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've had painters who say they get they get headaches by Sunday, being away from it, and they can't wait to get back to work on Monday so they can paint some more. So. <laughs> Was there a question back there? Yeah, I wanted to hear something from maybe everybody about how, <clears throat> excuse me, how you work with clients and what information you try to get out of them about their preferences. Uh, maybe a way to pose this question is, um, do you ever uh, show them historic drawings like the Thaw drawings to say, what do you see in this drawing that you like? I want to know how you translate um, you know, a client's vision. They, don't ha they probably don't have a vision when they walk in. That's why they're walking into you. But how do you go from? Where they, well, they are have with ideas. the final product. They have ideas. Yeah. Well, um, uh, just to expand on that, I think um, some of you mentioned uh, clients who come in with a portfolio of tear sheets. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you use them? Well, the other thing is that the majority of clients that come to you have seen something that you've done, whether it's in a publication, rarely, or um, the, the home of somebody else. And so there's, at the very beginning at least, there's some sort of um, you know, reference. shared reference. Oh, no. mm -hmm. I think that you, we, we, we show historic pictures, but really only as a support. We've already looked at them, interpreted the idea, and then we use it as support as opposed to, you know, how about this? Sometimes we, if we're, if there's a problem that's represented in a job site or in a project that there's an historic solution, we might present the drawing immediately. It depends on the, the nature of the situation. I think so much too of what we do is based on responding to the context that you're doing it in. So um, already you're, you're, you can bring something to the conversation by saying this is a 1928 building. It wouldn't be appropriate for us to be doing, you know, Santa Fe, whatever. Or, um. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll go into those like harking back to the sort of Maximilian Carlotta. So we go see the Napoleon III rooms. We think, oh, you know, that's, well, that's what you know, it's so fabulous, and you know, reinventing that. And then you go back to the client and explain that Maximilian and Carlotta, well, they never heard of them. And then you sort of go back, well, okay, sort of like Napoleon III, well, they don't know that. So you go to Victoria and then you go to Mexico, you know, and by the time you, then what you present, they look at, what did this have to do with, you know, Victorian Mexico? Nothing. It just was what inspired us, you know. Uh, Aramis is great at finding historical photographs that imply more the place and the feel. It's an apartment at River House, and so it's like pictures of planes and boats and, you know, this Art Deco land. So it's not specific to the current project. It's just about how we're getting to where we're getting. Um, so um, it's it's the process. Um, and, and we like to involve them in it, sort you of. You like to involve them in the process of most your Most of thinking. them enjoy it. I mean, most of them haven't seen these images before, or, or you know, the or how did you get to Carlotta and Maximilian? You know, so. That's that's an interesting um, approach. It's like awesome. your work. It's like springboarding to something, and a, mm -hmm. you take that literal and make it into abstraction, and and represent it, and it makes it fresher. Even in the literal way we do it, that's the same thing. But if you can even get more, it depends how far you want to extrapolate the idea. Um, when you say it makes it fresher, do you mean fresher to you, or fresher to the client, or? Well, you, no one wants to live in a period room. You like, really? you like aspects of the, not today. In the 1950s, we had plenty of period rooms on, on Park Avenue, but not anymore. People want 
comfort and they want variety and and therefore a period room is almost impossible to um, to produce for a client well that's interesting because one of the um, uh, one of the important um, points in the 19th century was comfort um, it was all about comfort that's that's why the furniture is um, upholstered. That's why uh, it's upholstered thickly and um, and tufted. Um, there's priorities, me, though. The, the, there's comfort and the, there's there comfort. Was, there were big formal rooms that were not comfortable, but they they telescoped into rooms that were comfortable. Those right. kind of cabinet rooms. And those actually were present in the 18th century, too, where there was really cushy room behind the big formal fancy room. Right. And also the other thing that's always interesting to think about is comfort is uh, cultural. In, the, in medieval times, you could sit on a straw mat and be you know, thinking you're on an easy boy you know, you're recliner. <laughs> and now a recliner is, to some people, the apogee of comfort. Um, so. Uh, it changes. It's, 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 a, it's an evolutionary thing. And it's, therefore, it's another reason why it's hard to do a period room to live in, because they're not comfortable to our standards. Well, but people don't aspire to. The, the period rooms on Park Avenue in the 50s were either English or they were French. Um, nobody knows who Marie Antoinette is. There aren't any Mrs. Reitzmans around. Um, and, Except you know, for Mrs. Reitzman. And, and the, the culture <laughs> is not so much about, um, about anything Anglo-centric anymore. So. And nothing is more important than comfort. <laughs> right. you know, if you don't give them that, you really have not succeeded. There's also a sense of, um, for at least our residential clients, the, the sense of the, the whole process being almost like a couture fitting. You know, they really want that specific individualized project. Um, and maybe it's just our, our clients, um, or we've had a run of them, but they, they come and really want that kind of I want to say psychological investigation, but it, it's more that more more of a mood. They're more into a mood and, and achieving that than um, than than the a particular style, a particular um, aesthetic. And for us, it's it's actually easier to work with them as long as they stay in that mood. As soon as they start bringing out pictures, we get into trouble because they're they're looking at that picture one way, and they're not. And they're talking about something else. Mm. So as long as they stay out of the pictures, we, we can work with them better. Uh, as soon as they get into, like I, we had one client kept calling things mid-century modern, mid-century modern. And he was not talking about mid-century modern. You could tell he was not talking about mid-century modern. It was some weird industrial aesthetic that he equated with, uh, we, we found out, with a um, design within reach catalog shot of an Eames chair sitting in front of a brick wall. <laughs> and he kept, he had this language that as soon as you got past that and started talking about mood and, and feeling and, and space, you got it. And it, and it, was, it was smooth sailing after that. So. Um. Okay, I was told I have one more question. Uh, oh, um, Jennifer, can Jennifer give her question? Yes, well, thanks, Gail. Um, I have a question actually back to process. In looking at the thaw drawings as documents of interiors, I'm wondering what is the current uh, process for designers and that you know the generation of Albert Hadley and and uh, sister Parrish and and uh, William Pullman and all of those folks were still using watercolors primarily to communicate their designs to their clients what's going on now and what are the future sort of documents that the next generation of interior scholars are going to be looking at what's what are the documents that you're using and presenting and creating and what do you see as the next evolution of that Computer modeling. <laughs> Absolutely. And will those make their way to the Cooper Hewitt one day, or? Yeah, they're easier <laughs> to We're store. debating <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, we do have some computer-generated drawings uh, already in the collection, and we expect to uh, expand um, that aspect of the department because many people are just not drawing mm -hmm. um, it's, anymore. It's interesting because we. We've been doing that in the office, and the, uh, there's, there are a lot of uh, computer-generated models, but the clients can't see them. Yeah. And 
We, we, what do you mean by they can't see them? Well, they, they, you give them the, the hard edge drawings that usually come out of a computer. But you know, one of the women in the office is very talented, and she overdraws them, and then they're engaged by them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's they, they want the warmth that the pencil can create. Um, and that can't be, it's hard to present texture in, um, in those images. And in fact, uh, that goes off on to whole, spawns a whole conversation, but people aren't trained in texture anymore. They're only trained in, in, in mass because of the computer screen. So you know, a lot of what you learn as an apprentice now is what things feel like and how they look and how they touch. So it's, it's, it's very interesting, that whole idea of how you present your work. It's also not a finished drawing. I mean, what, what works most for us is, is the modeling so that you can walk around an apartment and be looking at you know different aspects of it from different points of view. So that's not, that's actually something that a client sometimes has trouble seeing, like you're saying, they don't see orthogonally or whatever. Um, but for us, it's, and for you to store that, you're really storing sort of a program as opposed to sort of a right. finished product. And, right. and not to be old and cranky, uh, there are certain things that the computer can't do. and. Uh, um, and we've had we did a staircase once, and it was six stories. And every time it landed a different floor, that arc could not be done. Ada Louise Hux Huxwell, and a couple of weeks ago in the Times, talked about sort of buildings that have the feel of being created on a computer. They could only have been created on a computer. This staircase had to you had to stand there with the plaster man and carve away stuff. You had it on paper, but the reality was the finished product could not be done. Like, but I think mechanically. that's a very good point because I think that's that's the same with any kind of drawing technique. And and you can also you could you could see buildings that were built from foam core models. Mm -hmm. You know which ones they yeah. are. You drive by them. You can point oh foam core or chipboard or plaster. <laughs> you know exactly what they were modeled in. But yeah, that's sure. that's in a, an ability within the designer to go beyond the model and to take the model into that kind of in between realm between reality and and the representation to him or herself. Uh, and that's the talent that, you know, it's really hard to teach, I know, it's, it, you can't. It's when, when I was a student, they were, we were very excited about looking at these drawings as primary documents. And what my training at Winterthur was very much about going back and looking at the original sources and, and drawings were considered a primary and original source. And Peter Thornton wrote this really good book called, it was a history of decoration through Western European interiors and, and they were all captioned beautifully and they sh showed how the styles had changed. And he did 17th century Dutch interiors in the same way he did all the rest. And he used them as a literal um, representation of a Dutch interior. And then the, the Dutch um, historians came back and said, look at these are pastiches. These are made up interiors to look good in a painting. And it really under um, pulled the carpet out of our idea of looking at these drawings as accurate representations. And so they then became a tool to compare to the real architecture and how they might have evolved. So objects might be correct or you know the detail, the, mark, the moldings might be correct, but the arrangement is a fantasy. And that is what's so great about looking at these drawings because some of it's fantasy, some of it's reality. So you 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 are looking at something that's transposing, and computer drawings are just like that too. We've never used uh, much in the way of hand done renderings either. I mean, when it comes to presenting something to a client and trying to show them what it's going to be about, it's all different kinds of images and and sketches and not just sort of storyboards or fabrics, but I mean truly images that have nothing to do with they wouldn't think. But in the end, you go back and you show that same board to somebody two years later. The room's in there, you know, but we've never, I've never seen sort of often they're not very successful, I don't think, renderings. Um, I must point out, um, lest that people get confused, um, the thaw drawings are not presentation drawings. Um, the thaw drawings are documents. Portraits. Yeah, they're portraits Records. of rooms yeah. done um, after the fact. As a matter of fact, um, part Part of, in terms of our historical research, uh, many of the drawings were commissioned right after a redecoration was done. Um, and uh, the um, owner or the, the client would uh, commission um, a whole album of drawings of the exterior of the house and all the rooms in the house. Um, and the drawings in the Thaw exhibition 
come from these albums. Um, so um, have any of you ever, um, there are, although the tradition is getting um, um, less and less, there are some artists who are working today who will do portraits um, of rooms uh, on commission. Um, have any of you ever worked with these or, or uh, with these professionals or um, how do, do you only document your interiors with photography? I think the only time we've done it was when, uh, what's his name? David Lindley. David Lindley did a model of a townhouse front, back, and sides of the whole, it was like a humidor, but it was a, the house. A three-dimensional a model. model. A may, yeah. you know, a wood. Inlaid wood. So. Yeah, with all the details. Um, most, most people, most, most people who buy commission portraits of the rooms are the owners, and there's a social connection between the painter and they know the person socially, and then they commission the rooms. Very few people call up and start casting about for a, someone to r render r rooms. Well, Gail, we were talking about Jeremiah when you yes. and I first met, who uh, I think is <coughs> incredibly talented, but, but on the unique side as far as... Uh, yes, seems to be. Yeah. Uh, it'd be great to have one. I would love one. You know, it wouldn't be great, because it would be such a great connection to a tradition. Yes, yes, it would be. Yeah. Um, we had this fantasy when we were planning the exhibition of having some kind of uh, fundraiser, um, and the winner would get um, J Jeremiah, who who I don't know, um, or or somebody like him, to paint the interior of one of their rooms. But um, uh, that idea didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Probably too expensive, <laughs> um, uh, so we had to abandon that. Um, but um, one of the things I talk about in my essay in the book is um, uh, this article in the New York Times. I think I mentioned it to you, Hermes, um, in February of, of last year, wh where um, uh, people who had who had just moved into houses or they were moving into an architectural icon um, or just had their interiors um, uh, redone would commission photography mm -hmm. of all the rooms in the house. And one of the photographers said, um, uh, and I'm quoting him, uh, people fetishize their interiors today like they never have done before. Um, well, the so ultimate fetish are those uh, are Kaufman rocks? interior, well, the Kaufman interiors in Palm Springs, mm -hmm. which, you know, right. they're just the iconic uh, modernist uh, view which of a, of, a, of a house and a town and a sort of way of life that almost I don't think ever really existed. Probably not. <laughs> but it's our our uh, fantasy of, of Hollywood or Palm Springs. Or and that's what people who go sure. to those towns today are, are looking for. They want to step into those photographs. Um, okay. <laughs> Do we have time, Erin, for some um, uh, some questions from the audience? Um, if anyone has any one last question, I'm sure that you know, the designers should stick around to you for a moment if you want to ask them individually. Um, I do want to let you know at some point soon, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> please thank you all, and please um, come up if you have uh, any questions that you'd like to ask the participants. And thank you for coming.